Hello, everyone. Good morning, Thinker. Hopefully you're having a wonderful Tuesday morning. Today's... Oh, man, what is today? I don't have my watch on me. April 4th, I believe. Hello, everyone. Oh, I'm... Good morning, Thinker. My phone was... The volume on my phone was up, and I want to have some echoing going on. Okay. Okay. So, good morning. Here I am again. Uh, I got some different tea yesterday. Uh, so yesterday and today, I've actually taken a day off work. And uh, hey, Finish, how you doing? Thanks for coming. And I just wanted to kind of show my, my face, you know, put a visage to the voice, at least. I'm trying to do that more and more in, in, in each stream now that I have this new camera and everything. And I need to do it first because I didn't charge the battery for this one uh, yesterday. So it may die somewhere into the stream. But uh, still working on the tiger. Hopefully we can call the tiger itself uh, finished, at least this layer of glaze this morning. Uh, we just have a little bit to do. I need to zoom out so I can show you. By the way. Yeah, you can kind of see my whole setup as well. So this leg and the bottom part of the tail. So back here. Also, I want to figure out... Ah, I, I, I could have done that. Actually, that'll be part of the background, but... I want some kind of silhouette back here to show the fourth leg of the tiger. Uh, because as I stood back one day and I was really looking at this, I'm like, huh, it looks like a three-legged tiger, so we need to fix that. And it's interesting because I didn't do that on the uh, reference. And I think I see the same thing now on the reference. It's interesting how when you live for a long time with a painting, how these things kind of come out. We need to do a little bit with the, the tiger toes, and that would be it. So trying to get to it today. When we originally started this, I asked uh, for your setup, uh, your soup to nuts process, and you have given me that in spades. You have also said that this is the longest painting you have done. <laughs> um, I think so. I mean, well, you know, you connect both of them together, definitely, for a lot of cases. Um, honestly, I think there's a painting I did that had probably more sessions a uh, portrait of a friend of mine named patrick and that's on my website under paintings i need to deliver that to him i painted it for him because he's such an awesome person uh, but that that was happening right around after i was diagnosed with uh, kidney disease and i could only muster up you know, because there was a lot of physical and mental kind of problems going on then, obviously, when you get diagnosed with a big disease like that. And I could only really muster up like a half an hour a day. So it took me like a hundred and something different sessions to finish that painting. So, you know, like a hundred or so days. But the count uh, for this, if you look at the opener on the top left, today is day 84. I mean, that's pretty amazing, guys. We've been doing this for 84 days. Um, you really get from the beginning of this stream. And uh, it wasn't even the tiger at the beginning of the stream. We went through the composition and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, but we, we soon got into the digital part of this tiger. And yeah, soup to nuts really says it on that. You wanted it, you got it. And I thought it was a great thing to do anyways. Because this is the whole process that I've taken. I've learned so much throughout this whole process myself. And hopefully anyone that watches this will learn as much as well. Actually, I'm still learning from the process. One thing that I want to do is go back through all the chats that we've had through these 80 some days and find the questions. 
and then um you know i've answered them for for you especially thinker because you've been here <laughs> along the ride the whole time and um i want to answer those in dedicated videos for other people as well i figured that would be really good besides uh talking us through what you're doing what what do you cut out of your process to speed up the process? Oh, like if I was doing... Hmm. That's a really good question. Like if I wasn't doing this on a live stream, what would I cut out? It would make it faster. Oh, I see what you did there. You're like, okay, so you're saying that this is taking the longest. What would I cut out? You know, I don't know. Um, I would have to look at some of the other paintings that I created. Um, my series of figures that were like the same. Well, actually, now that I look at them, some of the, because I have them back here. So the vulnerability series that I have and then veiled, um, faded, these figurative works that I've done. They're fairly simple compared to the tiger. Uh, the tiger painting is a complex painting. We have, uh, look at, isn't that wonderful guys? Where you, as soon as I start oiling this in or out, you see all of that color and value just come back. It's fantastic. Uh, it's one of my favorite things. Look at the tail. Everything changed with the tail there. But those paintings are pretty simple. So a big swath of blank background, right? So they, they didn't take as long. But if you look at the Patrick painting, there's so much complexity in the background of that painting. There's so much complexity in the figure. Um, maybe it's more the complexity of the, the painting itself that's taking the longest. So maybe you're seeing everything Uh, I'll keep thinking about it, but I'm pretty sure that, you know, there's not much I would cut out from this at all. Besides, you know, picking an easier composition, maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, to stick with the stoop to nuts ideas, just for anybody that's not showing up. Oh, thank you, Finnish. Uh, thank you for the uh, words of motivation there that it looks good i appreciate it uh for anybody that doesn't know what's going on uh anytime i start a new section of this painting that is dry it's going to be very dull that's what oil paint does usually some of it would be some of it would be glossy depends on if it has medium in it or not and but most of the time a lot of these colors are going to be dull because they're drying so I take uh, refined linseed oil very lightly and just a little bit and, and I kind of scrub it all over the place to bring those colors back. And we do that so that um, we're not painting over something that shows a different value or color. Hue, saturation, everything is different so we can match what we're seeing better. Oiling out is really important. Now this is going to be darker and blurrier. <laughs> Uh, to, to get very specific on what blurry or means, uh, that would mean that there's not a lot of sharp edges or no sharp edges at all within that area. That's all blurry is. It's just you get rid of sharp edges. I'm going to mix up my darkest dark right out the gate. This is what I do all the time as well. We're going to keep it very cool. So very blue. Hey Thinker, you, you had talked about uh, Mark Carter and Draw Mix Paint, and I watched a video of his about how he mixes paint. And I, yeah, thank you for pointing me out to that video because I'd, you know, I watched like all of his videos one year. I love, um, I love how he does things because he gives a lot of clarity, like in a step-by-step -step approach, kind of dumbs it down. The video I watched, it was kind of, um, it didn't have the clarity that I was looking for. It was a bit 
meandering. It's one of his top videos on mixing color or uh, how to match any color in the world he's talking about. But the great thing about it is he took, you know, the palette that he's working with and, well, he, and he dumped it down to like five colors. You know, he's really simplified it. And he did, at one point he said, well, you know, this is the power of working with a limited palette, you know, just five colors, is it really um, makes all the decisions a lot easier. And that is so true. You know, if you, if I had every color that I own on my palette here, um, it's going to make the decisions a lot harder as far as match it, trying to match the color that I want to match. And so it was nice to look at his little color wheel that he had on the video. And it was a red, you know, a blue, a yellow, so your primaries. And then he had um, a burnt umber, which is his brown. And then he had written down like purple, orange, maybe not orange, but these kind of uh, secondaries, a green. Yeah. And that was really helpful to... Um, kind of solidify in my mind, you know, if I make a color mixing video, like the best way to create it so that it's easy for anybody to understand and easy to follow, you know, create a methodology that always works, you know, a step-by-step -step approach that someone could like put up next to their easel and go, okay, I need to match this color. I'll go through these steps and I'll always get there. Like, no matter what. So I'm, I'm really uh, interested in that. That's one, of, after I started doing this painting, that's one of the, the questions that have come up a lot, you know, is mixing and matching color. A lot of individuals um, have trouble with that, especially with, you know, traditional mediums. It's interesting that I didn't get a lot of that with uh, digital medium, I think mainly because you can just, you can lean so heavily on just color picking, right? Just pick the color that you want or you need. You don't have to worry about matching it. Now, in the big scheme of things, this part of the tiger's leg doesn't really matter a lot at all. It's for so many artists, including myself, it's really hard to kind of just let things go a lot. And that's why I get so detailed all the time in my paintings, probably too detailed. It's hard to not describe the form and everything. But I try and keep in my mind, you know, this idea of the full composition and serving the, the full story rather than just describing everything in tremendous detail. What, you know what one thing I'm really interested in? And I want to ask it, I want I want this to be in like a question format. Because you guys are here. And I want to see what you think about it. So artists like Andrew Tischler, um, who are very detailed painters, like they make these beautiful paintings and they're not, you know, he's not the only one. There's a ton of them out there. They make these absolutely gorgeous paintings. Um, I'm interested to see how you silhouette the, the fourth leg. 
Yeah, I think I'm going to do that digitally first. I'm going <clears> to <throat> revitalize that digital uh, painting and put a fourth leg in there first. It's actually in there in the photo, but it's behind this leg here and you can't see it. So I'm probably going to, you know, like if, if I figured out like the width of the tire body here, and it's not going to be that width in the back, it's going to be a lot smaller, probably right here. So the tiger leg would barely show just like in the photo on this side. So there'd be a bit of silhouette. I may draw it out just a, a little bit further. So maybe it's like right here and it's just a big black area that would cover up that whole thing. Actually, I may, tr now that I think about it, I may try it on the painting. But the, but Andrew Tischler um, and other artists that like them, they make these beautiful paintings. Um, and they're absolutely wonderful. I mean, you can't, I mean, the guy's full-time artist making a good amount of money. I'm pretty sure he has the freedom. I mean, I don't really care about the money. The, the most important part of that is the freedom. He has the freedom to just do art, you know, uh, which is, which is wonderful. Regardless if it's like, oh, I need to get something done so I can pay the bills. It's still related to a craft that he loves and people are paying for things that he makes from his mind. You know, it's not something that uh, someone else manufactures that asks him to do something. But I always want to feel like I, I, I always feel like I want to challenge the individuals that paint so detailed and myself, you know, because I've, I'm seeing myself in that same boat now. Um, just as detailed, maybe not as good as Andrew Tischler. <laughs> um, a, a little bit of, uh, my imposter syndrome got through there. Um, but I always want to ask, you know, what's the story? I mean, when you're painting that way, is the story, it's just beautiful. And is that enough? And that's the question. So what do you guys think? And this is more for yourselves as well as it is for me. What's most important for you? Just making beautiful paintings? Which is perfectly fine, by the way. I, do, I don't want to denigrate that at all. Um, making beautiful paintings that everybody loves is, is a huge purpose. Or do you want to strive for more? you know, to go beyond that. Or maybe it's, <clears throat> maybe it's not one and the other, like one is better than the other. Maybe the story isn't more. Something, do you, I, I'll, I'll count them as two different things. So this is for both of you, thinker and finish. What kind of paintings do you want to make? Paintings that are beautiful or paintings that have a narrative, a story behind them? Oh, I'm 
waiting patiently for any answers you may have. And that's okay. If you don't have anything right now, give it some thought. I think it's important to kind of think about that for yourself. Even early on in your career, regardless of what your skill level is, you know, anybody watching this video after it's not live anymore and it's on my YouTube channel, where do you see yourself? No, there you go, Thinker. For me, I find myself looking for subjects that have meaning for someone. Oh, that's really good. That's a really good point. That. Sorry, my, my uh, selfie camera, I think, gave up the ghost. Yep, I should have charged that. Waiting for the AC adapter to come in on that thing. I think that's a really good um, addition that you just added to that. Looking for subjects that have meaning for someone. You know, see that now you've added in a kind of like a third, even more motivating element, I feel, for some of us. It's, you're not just making beautiful paintings for yourself, but something that maybe you would love to paint and also, you know, really affects someone emotionally. Both really, uh, Finnish says, but I believe that art is a form of expression and I'm always more intrigued by and drawn to pieces that tell a story. Yeah, I'm kind of like in the both as well. <laughs> After I asked the question, I was like, I think both. Yeah. Do I want to make an ugly painting? No, I want to, I want to make something that has a story as well to it. Oh, I just thought of a painting that Andrew Tischler did make. So what I think his top video, the one that has the most views is he painted a, uh, indigenous person from Australia, a beautiful portrait of a person with a tattooed face. Um, and this, I believe this guy, uh, he, I, I watched a bit of that video and he was talking about how this person was a gang member and that's where all the tattoos came from and had a pretty difficult life. And after he got out of all that, he's really dedicating his life to help other people, other individuals like himself to get out of that uh, kind of vicious cycle, right? It had a story to it. And I wonder if that's the reason why it was such a, you know, highly watched video. Could be because, you know, the subject matter. Well, the subject matter. Yeah. I mean, it's a portrait. It's a person. It's what we can Id identify with. I feel like the, the art that really touch us and s always touches people in some way has humans featured in it um, somehow, you know, some, some configuration, either a figure, a portrait, or something representing a human. But don't get me wrong, I love his paintings. He's got some fantastic landscapes that are just breathtaking. And I think that could be enough because I would love to own one of his paintings and have it in my house. You know, I'd study the shit out of it. <laughs> Excuse my language. <laughs> right? But it would be beautiful. I mean, I would be, he makes paintings that people would love to live with. Uh, there's a, an artist that I spoke to once. Her name was is uh, um, Victoria Adams. She's a landscape painter here in Washington. Full-time artist. 
wonderful person because I called her up out of the blue and I, you know, just, you know, as a nobody around here, just wanting to talk to her, you know, as, sorry, I feel like I need to lighten that up a bit. So you got, no, I think it's good on the stream. Um, you know, as an artist that I just moved to Tacoma last year, no, not, yeah, last year, but we haven't even been here a year yet. Um, actually before I started the live stream and everything, and I, I wanted to ask her, you know, just kind of pick her brain about, you know, how to become a full-time artist. And one of the things that she, she said to me that kind of stuck with me, and it's kind of a conundrum. It's one of those things that artists always kind of have a difficulty with is how can I paint what I want to paint yet um, sell that work, right? I think individuals that do landscapes are at an advantage here because it's so approachable. But the word she said that, that really stuck with me was, um, you got, I mean, you have to make paintings. You don't have to, but in order for someone to spend money on a, a piece of art, they have, they want to live with that piece. Okay, it's something that affects them that can be up on their wall. They live with it for a period of time. For whatever reasons, it's beautiful, it has a wonderful story, it matches the drapes, you know, whatever. But they have to be willing to live with it. And I was like, well, that makes a lot of sense. And there's a lot of ways to go about doing that. And you don't have to paint landscapes, uh, still life, you know, these kind of very approachable things. Honestly, if, if you're a figure artist like myself, like I love painting figures. It's all about finding the right market in, in most cases. Yeah. Well, not in most cases, in all cases, it's all about finding the right market. I don't think America is the greatest market for uh, figurative work. But I know there's individuals out there that love it, right? I put up all my work on Sachi, S-A-A-T-C-H-I, uh, SachiArt.com actually. I thought it was just Sachi.com, but anyway. And I sold a piece recently. And it was the one thing that I thought would go the last. I was like, no one's going to buy this. And the reason why I thought that it was because it, it's a painting of a figure, uh, a man, a male figure that um, has genitalia exposed, like just right out there. It's not super detailed. It's, it's not, uh, it's a classical pose. It's not meant to be sexualized in nature. Although I guess it could be, and it depends on where your mind goes. Right. Um, and I was like, there's no way anybody's going to buy this because you know, people don't want to live with that, but guess what? It's sold. And I was like, wow. Okay. I have no idea. Right after that, I said, I have no idea. So I'm going to put all my work out there. It further solidified in my mind that whatever feeling that you have on your artwork, like it's not sellable. No one's going to like this. It's not good enough. Blah, 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 blah. That's all bullshit. Because, you know, I put a painting into a show of other artists that, oh, which I finally got back, by the way, I would show it off to you, but that camera just died. Um, 
I just, I got, I won best in show in that. And I almost was like, no, I'm not even going to put my painting. It was like ridiculous. I, it's all the other work is just so much better. Nope. I won best in show. It's like, what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> so you never know. I, th I am 100% certain that we as artists can paint what we want to paint, can paint the digital or oil painting or gouache or, or whatever you choose, the landscapes, the figures, um, whatever subject matter. We can paint whatever we want to paint. We just have to find the people that want to live with it. Is it easy? No, it's, I don't think it's very easy, but I will say this. It's a lot easier than it used to be with the ability to put your artwork online now and possibly reach anybody in the entire world. You have, you have so much more possibilities now with the online space. That's another thing that uh, Victoria Adams said to me. And this is an artist that's represented in multiple galleries that makes her living uh, by selling paintings at galleries. And she said, you know, galleries are kind of dying right now. You know, brick and mortar galleries? Yeah, that, you know, it's very difficult for them to stay open because they have to pay rent. They can only show so many uh, pieces of work. Um, the only advantage that they have over you know, online galleries for purchasing is that, that kind of in the moment thing. Um, people that want to actually see the artwork before they buy it, right? She was even talking about because of, you know, the, the financial thing, go, you know, stuff going on with America right now, that uh, a lot of galleries have seen paintings come back to them that they had sold before and the retirees or the, the, the people that bought them are getting older now, now and they're like, you know, I don't want to keep this painting any longer. Can you sell it for me? You know, and they're trying to resell these paintings that they had bought previously. And she said, you know, do smaller work. You know, go deep on a subject matter that you like and then put them online. And she's been doing it for like 35 years. Beautiful artwork. So I listened. I'm going to be doing a lot of what she says. Some of it not. But yeah. Sorry for all that. Uh, so pretty much finished that leg up really quickly. I'll step back on it uh, a little bit uh, later. But yeah, just uh, darkened it up. I grayed it down because the local color is kind of a white of the tiger's legs. And on the edges, like this edge here, you see that? It's just, let me see if I can zoom all the way in. This edge is a lost edge. I like that it's lost there. We don't really need it. And I'll probably darken up the, the background here. Oops, that had gray in it. So finish, you say, I don't think that people necessarily buy paintings that they want to live with. Some people just have more money than they know what to do with. 
Yeah, there they are. Many, many different uh, mentalities about behind painting. You are totally right on that. Um, I can't kind of pigeonhole it in one place. But I guess if you're looking at the market at large, you know, kind of the people that, you know, the, the larger market, maybe it's more, um, yeah, beautiful work. I mean, heck, if you go and look at like Fine Art America or um, any of these big places that's, that sell prints, like that's their main thing is selling prints of artwork. It's the, the top paintings, the most sold prints are going to be ones that have, you know, that are easy to live with, right? That have some kind of pithy kind of story or emotion to them or something that, that are, that are easy to live with. I mean, that's going to be something there, right? But you're right. There are other people that are just like, ah, I just have a bunch of money and this guy is a big status symbol. So I'll buy his work. Hey, Ashton. Thanks for joining and good morning. Uh, Thinker says smaller is a relative term. How small is small? I know I was thinking the same thing. How small is small? she was talking in terms of things that you can finish every day. It's like, wow. Okay. Not sure about that. Do I have wall space uh, large enough for the tiger painting? Yeah. Um, well, I don't. I don't have enough wall space for all my paintings. That's the problem. I, I need to sell all these darn things. If they're finally all up on uh, Sachi.com or SachiArt.com. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to be kind of moving some paintings around on the back wall and putting this one up. Actually, no, I take that back. Uh, this will go into my wife's office after, not after it's right after it's done, because it needs to sit in here for a while and dry for probably about a month or two at least before I add um, a varnish to it. But yeah, I'll, I'll have a, a place to put it, definitely. I would... I would like to sell most of my paintings and get them out of here so I don't have to move them again. Because uh, we're not, we're planning not staying into the, in, at this home um, after our lease is up this year. So we'll be moving. We're not sure where, but we're going to be moving again. And trying to move all these paintings um, and not damage them is really difficult. Uh, do you have... Okay, you already said that. Okay. Yeah, as far as small is concerned, I would think... I think she was talking more along the lines of what can you finish a lot of quickly? Like a lot of paintings that you can move quickly. And then there's, there's pricing concerns with that, right? So things that you enjoy to do that you can do quickly that you know, you have a market for of people that would be interested in buying them, maybe, you know, identifying some kind of market. Which, you know, you got to paint the paintings to kind of put them out there to kind of find your, your market anyways. But smaller works that um, don't take so long that when you, let's say if, if I charged, um, let's go really low, $10 an hour for this painting, right? And that's how I do my charging on paintings. If I charge $10 an hour because my time is important, um, and that's way low, that's super low. That's not even, I mean, in most states, that, that's not even um, minimum wage, okay? So if I charge that much, 
this painting would still be thousands of dollars. Yeah. Well, maybe it wouldn't be thousands of dollars, but yeah, it would, be, it would definitely be in the thousands. It's gotta be. I mean, I would never ch charge that much for this painting. It would be a lot more than that. Uh-oh, for the soup to nuts, are we going to have to watch paint dry before we get to the varnishing process? <laughs> um, no. The varnishing process is the same everywhere. It's not... Literally, this painting would take all of three minutes to varnish. And the process is pretty simple. Um... So I could say I have several dry paintings right now that I could do like to show you the varnishing process if you wanted to see that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of like the idea of just setting up a live stream, putting on some music and calling it the paint drying live stream. Watch paint dry. <laughs> and every one of you must attend. Maybe it could be meditative. <laughs> Most boring stream on the planet. That would be when everyone unsubscribes from my YouTube channel. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm going to do much more with that tail back there. Keeping it uh, definitely at this point because that part of the tail is even further back. I'm not only keeping the edges very soft, as soft as I can, but I'm also kind of blending in the difference between the black and the white so that it kind of turns into a gray. That way there isn't a harsh, any of these harsh transitions between what's really a black and a dark gray uh, doesn't attract a lot of attention. I'm always thinking about our center of interest, which is way up there, not down here. Yesterday I had uh, no, no desire to do sculpture work at all, but once I actually started and got in the zone, yeah, that's really important. Um, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that. Getting into the zone, just getting started. Great job on pushing past that I don't feel like it phase and getting to it. The more you do that, that's a, that's a muscle. That's called willpower. And you build your willpower when you do that. Um, if you want the science behind it, you can read a wonderful book by Roy Baumeister called Willpower. It's fantastic. Uh, just goes to show sometimes you just need to start and not listen to your feelings. Exactly. Yes. Um, you got it. That's perfect. There's a, another book I read. I can't remember which book it came from. But it's all about, and I think I did have some videos on it, but it's all about how feelings follow action. It's kind of, you know, it goes hand in hand. If you sit there and well now yeah it's it's more action like if i sit here and and i keep beating myself up saying i'm awful my paintings suck and no one's going to buy these paintings and i sit kind of slumped over right in this kind of position where it's you know maybe i'm acting it out like an actor or something those feelings will follow you if you or if you're acting depressed in a lot of instances it will reinforce those feelings now i know that there is um that could get into a lot of argument because you know depression is a real thing but the the point of it is the alternate exists and I know we've all have felt that in a lot of places where you don't feel like doing something, but you just get started. You're like, okay, I'm going to focus on just a tiger toe and then just start painting that. 
And then eventually you're like, oh, okay, I'm really getting into this. I know we've all felt that and, and it is a thing. It doesn't work all the time, but it's there. And the point is that in many instances, um, your feelings follow your behavior. Uh, behavior comes first in a lot of places. Action uh, can really change how, how things go. And pushing past that, I don't feel like it, to just getting to it. Um, is really important. Okay, let's go to some tiger toes. I end up staying after class and continuing to work. Oh, fantastic. I was in there from 11 a.m. to 4.30. Just listen. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? So you're there for five and a half hours. Mm. Yeah, and you didn't feel like it. It's it's one of those, like, I keep harping about, um, you know, these minimums. You know, setting a minimum and getting to it every day. Uh, Ula is not here. She's at work. Uh, or they are at work. I'm not sure. Sorry about that. But um, try to stay away from pronouns. Um... <laughs> She, I think the last, or they, the last time I talked to them, uh, Ula was on like 12 days of daily art, uh, doing art every day. And what, why that is so important, like, and she was saying, well, you know, it's not that long. I'm spending maybe, my minimum is about like 10 minutes. You know, I just need to do 10 minutes of work. A day and as soon as you say that and even if you say it to other people like your head starts going into that's not enough that's not enough that's not enough um, and a lot of people will tell you that what are you gonna get done in that time that's not enough to be an artist well I hope to show you a lot of authority on that because that's what I've built my skill upon that you see right here has been on a minimum of 30 minutes a day every single day you know that's a minimum i set for myself and it could be a minimum for it could be shorter than that for anyone um i'm not saying that i've only done 30 minutes every single day but setting that minimum is just like what you did uh ashton where you're like oh, i really don't feel like it but let me just get started i can do this small chunk and if i still don't feel like it i'm i'm done for the day but i'll feel you know somewhat accomplished in that um, that has kept me going for, uh, what today, today is 3,721 days in a row of art. And that's a little bit over, that's 10 years and a couple months now. One of the biggest things. And the more you do it, the more you do the daily artwork, the more you build that muscle of willpower. And the fun, the great thing about it is a lot of that willpower seeps into thing, you know, the rest of your life. Like, oh, I really don't feel like exercising today. Uh, I don't feel like doing the dishes. I don't feel like mowing the yard. I don't feel like flossing my teeth. You know, all these things. Uh, your brain doesn't doesn't differentiate between flossing teeth and doing artwork. Your brain just knows that you don't feel like doing something, yet you've built up the willpower and you're you're doing it anyways, because you know it's good for you, or you're thinking in the long term. You know, you're not thinking, I just feel like, I, I don't feel like it right now, you're thinking, but if I do this today, it will help improve my life in the future in some way. So pretty interesting kind of psychological things going on there. Great job, by the way, pushing through. Be careful you don't burn out and do five, five hours every day. <laughs> That's the other side of it. 
but oh man, I love those in the zone, getting into the flow where time dilates and all of a sudden you're like, holy crap, it's 4.30. Felt like half an hour. So I uh, put it some more oil, even though I had oil on here before, I, I put some more of the refined linseed oil down, uh, mainly to uh, help the glaze that I'm putting on here, to help thin out what I'm putting down, basically. And most of what I'm gonna be putting down here is gonna be a lot of grays right now, a lot of gray. Graying out a lot of this. Yeah, that's the problem. I get burnt out because I overwork myself every day. Hey, and that's okay. I mean, a lot of people do that. So you, t you take that feeling, that burned out feeling that you've experienced multiple times before, and you feel into it. Like right now, you know, maybe you're burned out right now. Maybe you're like, I don't feel like doing art right now because I spent freaking five and a half hours yesterday. <laughs> And you say, okay, this is the way I feel, but what could I get done today, even though I feel like, I, you know, I don't feel like doing anything. You see how we get back to that minimum and how important it is? And your minimum, by the way, will never increase the rest of your life. The purpose of the minimum is the preparation for those hard days when you feel burnt out, when you're sick, when you're on a plane and it's four in the morning, you know. So accountability happening here right now. Uh, what could you do, Ashton, regardless of your burnout? Because it will happen again in the future. You know that. What could you still do, even though you felt bur feel burned out? You say, typically my class is from 11 a.m. to 1.45, but I stay and roll over into my profession, professor's next class. <laughs> the boring class, probably. It's like, uh, I don't need to go to that class. Or I'll go and sit into classes that aren't even mine and work on my stuff and chill and talk to the class and professor. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know you could do that. So the question that I asked, think and give it some thought. What can you do? I, I like challenging people that are on the stream. You guys are showing up. You're being here. You're pretty awesome for showing up. All, you're very awesome for showing up. Pretty awesome. You're very awesome for showing up all the time. And the best thing that I can do for you is give you a little nudge now and then. A bit of a challenge. That's how we grow. That's how we get better. So whenever the I don't feel like it's come around, what can you do? And this isn't just for me. This is or for you, Ashton. It's for Finnish that's on here, Thinker. Uh, anybody watching this. When you have one of those I don't feel like it feelings, what is what is something that you know that you can do regardless. Let me give you some examples. Well, my my example, my biggest thing, I know that if, um, when it happens, not if, but when it happens again, when I'm just like, I'm done with painting, I don't feel like it, or I don't have enough time, or I'm on vacation, I'm gonna bring my sketchbook and that's it. And it's going to be the end of the day or the beginning of the day or sometime in the day. And I'm going to sit down and I'm going to draw, draw the most mundane things. I'm going to set a timer for 30 minutes. I'm going to draw something very mundane. I'm going to try and draw it the best I can. And then as soon as that timer's done, I'm done. Whether the drawing's done or not. Because the important thing is getting it done. So that's an example. Welp, I think we have to take into account that the work I'm doing now is required of me. 
right? So even if I don't have the motivation, I don't have a choice. So I do the work regardless. Okay, so you're building up some willpower there, which is good. That's actually a good thing. You know, this is one of the things that's, that school teaches us, right? It's like, I don't feel like doing this, but I need to get it done. Probably the best thing that school could teach us. <laughs> um, but when school's gone, what are you going to do? When you don't have the teachers and the those uh, report cards and the, uh, you know, the money that you're spending on college to keep you there. I'm not sure if I can keep it up outside school. That is such a universal statement. And um, yeah, one that I'm definitely going to note down. Because so many artists the reason why I'm here right now so many of my friends and even myself if it wasn't for you know certain things align in my in my life I wouldn't be here doing art I'd you know be doing other things you know life kind of takes us in a different direction and then you know at some point hopefully We realize, you know, that was a passion that we had and we need to get back into it. And it's something to really kind of think about, to feel into, you know. Now, you may be talking about, I'm not sure if I can keep up the level of production that school requires for you when you get outside of school. And that's totally fine. You don't have to stick to those production levels, but something, do something, right? I ran track and XC, not sure what XC is, in high school and always thought that outside of school is continue to run, but I graduated and never looked back. Yeah. That doesn't mean that it has to happen for artwork as well. There's a learning experience there with track. So I'm really passionate about it or it's just to temp temporarily keep me happy. I'm hoping it's not the same for art. Hmm. Okay, I'll level with you here. I'm going to try and be as eloquent with this as I can. The more you do it, well, now let's start in a different way. When you begin anything, any skill, especially art, you know, any kind of sport, uh, thing, something that takes, you know, skill to do. Continuous kind of work. I'm not talking like driving a car or something like that, unless you go into, you know, maybe Indy 500 or, you know, something that where you're trying to go beyond, you know, the normal skill, you know, eventually driving a car, you kind of learn the basics and then it kind of just goes into the background of your mind and you don't have to worry about it anymore. It's kind of there, you know, the whole ride the bike kind of thing. But art is not like that. Art will continually challenge you. And when you build up your willpower by sticking with daily practice, you begin to learn to enjoy challenge and why is why is that so important why is beginning to enjoy challenge so important it's because once you get to the point in art where it's not fun anymore 
because you have to work at it, you're on a plateau and this will happen. I'm, I'm telling everyone here, you will reach a plateau that could be months long or a year long where you feel like you're not progressing at all. Like it's a slog and you have to draw on willpower and all kinds of other things to keep me motivated, like switching up your subject matter, trying different, um, mediums, uh, different settings, you know, everything you can do to keep motivated in it so that you can get past that, um, plateau. But once you get past that plateau, you get this kind of extreme lift and skill level, and it's a big dopamine hit. Um, if you're not certain what that means, dopamine is, it's a chemical that is excreted in your brain. Uh, video games uh, prey on this tremendously. Uh, you get a constant, you know, dopamine hit after dopamine hit. It's the reason why, you know, in the middle of the night, you're, or any time throughout the day, you're scrolling through Instagram or, um, you know, TikTok or any of those uh, things out there because you're getting these kind of dopamine hits to your brain. It feels good. Your brain's like, oh, this is interesting. Do more of that. Do more of that. And art is like that. When you start out, you're going to get all kinds of dopamine hits because you're finding out new things and you're improving really quickly and you're trying new stuff and you're, you're, you've been challenged, but you, you see progression right away. Eventually that slows down and the dopamine hits slow down. And if you haven't built up the willpower, it's really hard to continue going. I guess that's a, a long witted way of saying that it's going to get hard Ashton for art. And right now is the time to build up the skills that you need to get past those hard points. If you really want to continue this art for the rest of your life. I do find myself doing art a, on the weekend outside of school and enjoying it. That's good. That's really good. If you can separate it from school, like where people are pushing you to do it, that's a really good indication that it's something more than just a phase, right? Now, the last thing I want to do is push you into something that, you know, eventually, you know, maybe a year from now or a couple months from now, you're like, yeah, I don't really want to do art anymore. You know, if you really feel into that and you really kind of get connected with yourself and you're like, yeah, that's true. I, I really don't want to do this anymore. I want to do this other thing. That's fine. Totally cool. Stick with that. Um, but stick with it. Stick with something. There's a tendency for a lot of people, a lot of young people, including myself, when I was younger, um, to go from thing to thing to thing. Because at the beginning, it's easy. Er. At the beginning, it's not as hard. But when we get into the difficult points, it's easy to say, okay, I really don't feel like doing this anymore. And then to stop. And that's okay. I mean, if you have to go through uh, and try out all kinds of different things all the time to find your one thing that you really love to do and that you can continue with the rest of your life. I think that's really good. But even that one thing is going to, you know, challenge your willpower to continue through. You'll have those burnout days. You'll have the days when you're sick. You'll, and it's the action that's important. Uh, that's, that's where I'm trying to differentiate myself as a creator on YouTube and everywhere else, uh, is exactly what we're talking about here, Ashton. Um, 
Florent Fargus, uh, the paint coach, uh, Chris, I forget his name, Chris something or another. Um, Andrew Tischler, all these really big names on YouTube, right? That, that are just amazing artists that are helping people. There's not a lot of talk about how to keep going, how to keep motivated, time management, willpower, um, energy management. All of these personal development things, that is what is the foundation for actually making this stuff. I think it's more important than skill because you can't build the skill unless you're doing it. It comes before the finished painting. It comes before being famous. It comes before uh, getting better. It's the work. The ability to get in front of the canvas and to stay in front of the canvas for, you know, a good amount of time. I, I hope that what I say is motivational. It's not supposed to be ranty in any way or lecture like so any feedback that you can give critical please if that is helpful at all please let me know and if it's not please let me know that's even better like yeah dude you, why don't you just shut up and paint <laughs> that's what that's what i need uh definitely but i know you can do it if you're committed to it I can give you the tools to help you so it's not as hard to keep going, to realize it uh, as a thing for the rest of your life, this art thing that you love right now. Yeah, hopefully that was helpful. Okay, so I'm working on the, the right foot down here of the tiger. Again, trying to uh, bring the saturation down on all of the oranges that are here and keep it soft for the most part. Soft, uh, like, you know, not, soft edges, not any hard edges down here so that it kind of blends in a little bit, uh, a little blurry. That's how you make things blurry. But at the same time, I want to make sure that the forms communicate that there are some, you know, a change in direction from this leg kind of comes down and the toes poke out, right? And then each of these tiger toes, the four tiger toes have like a roundness to them. Um, so still trying to keep that form as well. Which is so important if you're describing anything representationally. And I do feel like that I need to lighten it up down here a bit and separate uh, the end of the toes from the shadow that is being cast on the rock. Just very subtle. Yeah, that's really good. I'm happy with that. What time is it? It's 540. Okay, we are already past an hour. My 10 minutes, but I want to get this left foot done today. If I can get this left foot done right now, um, pretty much done with the tiger. The silhouette of the leg will be part of the background, I feel. Definitely. Well, done with this glazing part of the tiger. There could be some small adjustments to the tiger moving forward, but uh, for the most part, that will be done. Okay, so more of the gray that I'm mixing up here. I need more blue in this. Yeah, that's good. Darken it up a lot. Okay. 
I'm also making sure that, uh, you know, a lot of what I've done before, these, you know, that initial layer is showing through still. I always want to try and keep some of that. I mean, with glazing, glazing, it'll happen. It'll become this kind of subtle uh, thing where a lot of these colors and shapes are kind of showing through the glazes. Some of it will be covered, some of it won't. But always kind of keeping, you know, the vestiges of the very first layer in there. I feel is important. That's where you get a lot of texture. I'm going a little too fast right now. I just threw a bunch of dark color down and kind of screwed up where some of the drawing is. So I need to look at that again. Slow down a bit. Take the time it needs, Chris. I am adding a little bit of transparent earth orange into these mixtures. I don't want it to get too warm with these grays. Uh, I want these to be pretty cool grays down here. But it's, you know, it's all relative. As you can see what I'm putting down right now. Well, hopefully you can see. Maybe I can zoom in a bit. And I apologize, I just realized I haven't changed my reference at all. I need to move that down. Let me do that real quick. I'll be right back. actually compare the reference on the live stream against what I'm doing. Which I'll, I keep saying this is really helpful. <laughs> when I can see the reference, uh, when, I, when I can look at the live stream and see where I'm at, it's actually super helpful. Um, you know, getting away from the painting seeing it from that far away digitally in this little tiny format. And by the way, Thinker, I'm actually adding in a lot more teal down here as well. Adding some green to it also. Like a a teal that leans a bit closer to green, especially in these kind of white areas where the local color of the tiger's fur is white. 
because we, there's so much green uh, of the foliage around that I'm pretty sure it would reflect that. Okay. Now I'm wondering if I've scared everybody off. Or if everybody else is just busy doing other things. Ashton, you're probably getting ready for school, I would guess. Or on your way to school, maybe. <laughs> he's like... They're like, oh yeah, he's just rambling on about stuff. Uh, Non-art related, you know. Whatever. I'm getting ready. Going to school. Totally cool. Everyone has life and things to do. It was really interesting yesterday because um, today and tomorrow I have a day off work. Or yesterday and today I have a day off work that I took. And yeah, I figure you get ready for class. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, we went to this... Uh, I forget what you call it. It's like... They have them in several places around the United States where they have these towns where everybody wears like the clothing from the 1850s and they're in the really old fort and you know they're they're not acting out like hey like they they're like they're not really acting as if they are from that time but they're just kind of there to represent you know what people were, would do back then right and it was interesting looking at it because and and walking through this place because it was so simple um not i i feel like it was not you know not like today not that i would want to go back there oh my god no running water you know no heat no air conditioning uh it was yeah i would not survive at all <laughs> but uh what was great about it was just having that kind of quiet simplicity sometimes was nice today's world is so different the amount of information that we get and the things that we have to do every day and it's i think that's why i crave when i go on vacation is the mountains can't hike in the mountains right now but we'll probably go do a a, a hike that's at the uh the foot of mount rainier today or somewhere down there i'm just uh taking way longer than usual to get ready i felt like dressing up today so i can start in a great mood ah good idea good for you i'm sure you'll look fabulous I think I should do that more often. Look better on the live streams. Very lazy when it comes to clothes. 
overly functional. Oh, the tiger toes. Trying to bring back the shape of these toes that they were lost. And the shape of the shadow, which is really important. I mean, I don't need to go into super detail down here, but the, the most important thing for these areas that are not uh, part of the focal point is to make sure that they don't detract away from the focal point and a lot of times if if you don't pay attention to what you're doing down here because it is easier i don't have to be in crazy detail mode um or exactness for value and drawing and stuff but i just have to make sure that it doesn't there's there's not something that stands out and pulls the viewer's eye away from you know what i want them to look at which is the, the main center of interest. The tiger's head is the main center of interest, yeah. Okay. I'm going to step back. Let's see what we got. So you can all zoom out. any extra noise but uh yeah that's looking really good i think yeah I'm, I'm actually really pleased with this painting very pleased with it I think the light on it really helps as well. The way where I got the light situated is right where we want the light to kind of come down onto the tiger uh, in the painting. But uh, for now, I'm going to call this tiger done. So the tiger itself is complete. I have, I know there's a couple things on the head that I want to do as far as, you know, a final glaze. And maybe I'll see a few other things as I continue on with the painting. But for the most part, like 90% of the work on the tiger is complete. Uh, any other glazes from here will be super easy to accomplish. When you get to this point and you've already done, you know, initial layer and one glaze, Anything after that is just very subtle fixes or changes or edits. Um, yeah. 
it's looking really good. I'm really happy with it. Okay, so tomorrow what we'll be working on is uh, the background. I'm going to be going back to the top of the painting, all the way to the very top, uh, and working from the furthest back part of the background, so where it's pretty light back there, uh, and then work my way forward. Yeah. I don't think the background, the background will go pretty quickly because I'm going to be using a bigger brush, keeping it pretty soft. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to do my best I can back there. Okay. Thank you guys for... Let me get my mic back where it's supposed to go. Hey, thanks guys for joining me today. And yeah, now you can see the mic. That's the mic that I use. <laughs> I put it over here again. Uh, thanks guys for joining me today. Um, this is really a great day because I can say that the tiger's done today. Like that, I, We could move on to something different. And I'm really happy about that. Because we've been uh, spent a lot of time to get that right. And which is so important. Um, I'm excited to start the stream tomorrow, which will be at the same time today. So I will see you guys tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining and have a great, wonderful rest of your day.